you're running out of options, time to take some risks. In the twilight of her premiership, looking up for inspiration as Theresa May tries to save her Brexit deal. I've listened to concerns from across the political spectrum. I've done all I can to address them. And today I'm making a serious offer to MPs across Parliament, a new Brexit deal. And there are baubles for doubters on both sides. For Brexiteers, a pledge in law to try to avoid the Northern Ireland backstop. For the DUP, new protections for Northern Ireland's place within the UK if the backstop comes into force. For Labour, a chance to vote on a customs union compromise. And for Remainers, a vote on a referendum with a promise to deliver it if MPs endorse the idea. Do you think this is a hopeful Prime Minister, this is the last throw of the dice that should work, or is this a despairing and frustrated Prime Minister that she just cannot get this past Parliament and a significant number of her MPs? This Prime Minister is what she's always been. She's a focused grafter that has been given a job to do, and that is deliver Brexit, and she has been working at that. She has been fighting to deliver that. She has been, up until this point, prevented from doing so by uh, the House of Commons. And what she is doing now is giving the House of Commons the opportunity to step up to the mark, deliver Brexit. From one of the architects of Brexit... Hello, London! ..a predictable response. Now, she surrendered to virtually everything. And on the other side, an unsurprising thumbs down from ardent Remainers in the Lib Dems and the SNP. Ominously for the Prime Minister, a Tory Brexit supporter is concerned about her referendum offer. There were a lot of compromises that I have sucked up and I'm some more I'm prepared to suck up but actually giving any credence to this losers vote campaign of which is nothing other than a thinly disguised attempt to overturn a result these people didn't want in the first place uh, possibly pushed through by a um, remain dominated parliament that never wanted Brexit I just think that would be completely unacceptable and to give any credence to that which the Prime Minister appeared to do today uh, for me really is uh, a red line. So Lisa Nandy we've had the Prime Minister's new Brexit deal she specifically name checks you specifically reaching out to Labour MPs in leave seats has she won you over? Well it's a lot weaker than we were expecting from the briefings that were coming out of Downing Street this morning. And the real sticking point, I think, particularly for many Labour MPs like me in towns like mine, is the weakness of the offer on a customs union. The Prime Minister is effectively saying to us we can have a vote on a customs union. We've had a vote on a customs union before that didn't produce anything in Parliament. And the risk is that if we pass this bill at second reading without a much stronger push from the government to get behind a customs union and make sure that that becomes part of the legislation, that we end up once again knocking out all of the different options in Parliament, the bill falls and then we've only got a few weeks to go and we're staring down the barrel of no deal. Even Theresa May's cabinet allies believe the overwhelmingly negative response to the speech spells danger. One cabinet minister told me, this could all collapse by next week. Great. I don't want to have to vote for it, this minister concluded. A seemingly hopeless way ahead, but this is a prime minister who has always soldiered on. So far then, looks as if positions are hardening. Nick Watt joins us now. It isn't looking good for the PM tonight, Nick. Well, the Prime Minister ends the day far weaker than she was when she began the day. And it's interesting, talking to two former cabinet ministers, both had the same analogy. They're thinking of Emperor Hirohito's famous understatement at the Japanese surrender at the end of the Second World War, in which he said the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. Now, what happened today was that Theresa May squeaked this compromise through a 
very, very difficult cabinet meeting, and that has had two effects. It's far too much for the Brexiteers, so Boris Johnson has tweeted tonight, I supported you last time, Prime Minister, I cannot support you this time. And then it didn't go far enough for Labour. So where things stand now, support is diminishing. And where does that actually leave her then? Well, the Prime Minister is now in a very delicate position. I spoke to one former cabinet minister who said that she's turned a decent hand into utter failure. In my film, I quoted a current member of the cabinet who says they think that this whole effort by the Prime Minister could collapse within the next week. So what Tories are saying is that the Prime Minister is really faced with two choices at the moment. Go ahead with the vote and see your premiership and the vote collapse in flames or pull the vote. You'd have to resign, but at least in a technical sense, the legislation would still be alive. Mm. Nick, thanks very much indeed. Well, earlier I asked the Justice Minister, David Gork, how many minds he believed the PM had changed today. Well, we don't know at this point, but I think we have to try because this is the, if you like, the last best hope of leaving the European Union with a deal. How frustrating is it to hear your colleagues immediately just writing this off before it's even finished? Well, of course, I, you know, I want them to look carefully at what is uh, set out, to look at what the alternatives are, what the are? real choices are. Look, I, it's not for, for, for you know, I, I, I haven't been with them this afternoon to know how closely they've been looking well, at the you, various Well, you were in arguments. Cabinet this morning and wondering what that atmosphere was like for a start. Well, the, the Cabinet supported, uh, the Cabinet supports leaving with a deal and that there was a recognition that we needed to make a bold offer to the House of Commons to get this through. So every member of Cabinet has tied themselves to this deal then? Well, uh, collective responsibility. We had a long discussion this morning. Um, you know, people made their points, made their arguments. But there was no one at the table who said, I cannot support what the PM is about to announce this afternoon. Well, I think everybody, everybody recognised the uh, need to put a bold offer and nobody... Is know, that nobody, yes? Well, no, 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 nobody, nobody, nobody walked out, nobody left the meeting saying, I can't accept that. So the nobody Prime walked out is a major success well, in these I'm terms, I'm saying right? is that the cabinet, you know, the cabinet position is to support what the Prime Minister has said this afternoon. Three years ago, no one was talking about no deal. Do you Correct. accept that your government has created the space for the Brexit party, that you've created that vacuum into which no deal has found itself? Well, first of all, I agree with you that three years ago people weren't talking about no deal. No deal wasn't what was offered to the British people in the 2016 referendum. Um, the fact that we haven't been able to leave with a deal is deeply frustrating. This pivot has come three years too late. If you had realised that the Brexiteers would never have settled for anything less than no deal, would you have recommended that she pivot like this much earlier? Well, look, I think we have to focus on where we are today. And, you know, this has been a much more difficult process for the country, for Parliament, for my party than but I think where any we are of us would have liked or indeed But where we are today is a political climate of desperation and anger and frustration and questions about democracy that have been created by someone who didn't get the maths had changed, who didn't get the need to listen and to compromise. Now, I don't accept that characterisation. And I think, look, we can all look back on things and you know, all of us could have done things slightly differently. But you know, fundamentally, I think the Prime Minister has always wanted to do uh, the best for the country as she saw it, which was to deliver with a deal. Throw the dice for me. Um, what chance of it getting through? More than 50? More than 30? I'm not here to speculate on. on what it was. No, no, what do you think? You, you have to go into this with confidence. You have to go into this believing she can win it. Well, what I would say, and actually this is the point I made in Cabinet this morning, if we don't try this, then it's hard to see that there's any chance at all of getting a Brexit deal through the House of Commons. And that, I think, would not be in this country's best interest. This is essentially the only vehicle that is available for us to go through and deliver what I think is the sensible, pragmatic way forward of leaving the European Union, but with a deal. David Gould, thank you. Thank you. So has anyone shifted towards the PM's new Brexit offer? We're joined by the Labour MP for Redcar, Anna Turley, Conservative MP Sir Bernard Jenkin, who sits on the executive of the 1922 committee. Uh, we're going to have the DUP's Westminster leader, Nigel Dodds, as well. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, 
You represent a fairly broad spectrum of parties and opinions across the House. So the first answer goes to whoever can tell me that they are now convinced they will be supporting her deal. Silence, I'm afraid. Silence. OK. So Remainers didn't think it was aimed at them. Leavers thought it was watered down Brexit. She's pleased no one. Parliament is impossible to please. I mean, you are living proof that Parliament is now impossible to please. Well, there is one uh, resolution which did get through Parliament, the only proposal that actually had a positive proposition on Brexit, which was the so-called Brady Amendment. That did pass. There it was a way to a majority in the House of Commons, actually a stable majority, which the Prime Minister could then have gone forward with in terms of a withdrawal bill. I mean, some people I heard there saying about a no-deal Brexit's the only thing that would satisfy. Actually, we could have got the withdrawal deal through had the problems in the backstop been fixed and addressed. Yeah. And the sad fact is that the government didn't really pursue that, having been given the mandate. Well, to they do would that. argue, and they well, have argued, I know they that do, they have, Nigel. But having talked the EU in Brussels, said, we can talk say about no. the Brady Memo, we can talk about the Malthouse Compromise, but we still need the backstop in, until we see proof that it actually works. Well, I mean, the EU insists on the backstop, yes. and unfortunately, the government removed its negotiating leverage when it said, and a number of cabinet ministers were party to this, that it would never accept a no deal. If you take no deal off the table, you reduce your leverage, your negotiating position. But remember, Michel Barnier himself said that in the situation of a no deal Brexit, they would do operational checks away from the border. So, what is the argument about? So. The point is that you are sitting one, on one side where you want a backstop to go and Anna wants even more confirmation that we're going to be closer tied. Yeah, and it's, it's been very clear to me that by Theresa May trying to appeal to the ERG, to the DUP, she's not got this across the line. I believe there is one way that she can get something through Parliament and that's if she put a confirmatory ballot on the front of the she bill. She offered you the chance to vote for a second referendum today. Well, she didn't really, though. She said we can do it after we vote for her deal, which we could have done anyway. We could, we could put an amendment during the parliamentary process. There's nothing she's offered us that we couldn't already do in the process. For me, it's got to be there on the front of the bill because I will only vote that for her deal. That was a massive concession for her. You Actually, know how much she loathes the idea of a second referendum, and it was yeah. in her speech. Well, to be fair, the, hearing her mention it was actually very, very positive, and it says to me I think she's recognising the parliamentary mass that actually, if she moved towards us, she could have a, a large swathe of people across Parliament who would be willing to support her deal if it goes back to but the no, public to nothing, say so. There is nothing she could have said today. There's nothing she could have offered today that would have got the votes to get this through in a week's well, time. Well, in a way, the House of Commons is reflecting what the country feels. You don't know that? No, no the, the country, we know that the least popular option is her deal. Quite a lot of the country want to remain. Quite a lot of the country want to leave, if necessary, without a withdrawal agreement. Her deal is like trying to, it's neither fish nor fowl. It falls between stools. And then for the two main parties to seem to be, as, as Nigel Farage has characterised it, conspiring in a coalition against the people, as he put it. I think we've played into Nigel Farage's hands and we will see that in the, well, I fear we will see a very bad result for I'm the Conservatives I'm in, I'm in the I'm just confused. I mean, she, you know, she, the Stormont lot was a big offer made to you. Were you part of that, Nigel? Did, did she ask you if... Well, it, we had discussions you. with her before she entered into six weeks of discussion with the Labour Party. But of course, what she was but offering. But this time round. No, not not in recent weeks have we been discussing in any detail. Who any did of she this. talk to then? I mean, she took some stuff from Labour. She took the environment. She took the workers' rights. Yes, again, but that's not really ever sufficient, as far as I'm concerned, because although that's important, we don't have any trust or faith that she'll be there to deliver them in the long term. And from my perspective on the economy, workers' rights are great if you've got a job. But the impact of her deal, and particularly of No Deal, means there's no jobs. Uh, the, the, in, I mean, in it's such an unreal mind. conversation because actually in the political declaration that would bind her negotiation if it went ahead, workers' rights, environment, state aids, all the European framework rules for the single market would be embedded in the new agreement between the but UK and the But you're getting closer EU. to no deal. You're getting closer um, to I'm no afraid, deal. I'm uh, afraid, reluctantly, yes. Um, uh, and I, well, it's I, only I, reluctant I was at the C I was at CBI lunch this evening and I turned to the person next to me and I said, you know, just think... You know, it would all be over now if we'd left on the 29th of March. And he said, well, that would have released some investment. We could have made some decisions. So what would, what would you say to Bernard Jenkins, who would, who would opt for a no deal, a clean break, which would give you all kinds of, ultimately border checks and probably a border poll well, on a reunification. Uh, no, 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 I don't accept that because I go back to what Michel Barnier said himself and so did Leo Varadkar. 
and these are the people who will have to implement such, a, such, such checks, they said there wouldn't be any checks in the event of a no-deal Brexit. And, and one of the things that really uh, bedevils this entire negotiation is the fact that it's been based upon myths and downright lies. The idea that anyone wants a hard border in the island of Ireland is nonsense. Nobody is going to implement it, not least the Irish government could never and would never tolerated and the European Union have already indicated Anna. that they wouldn't have it. And the British government won't do it. And the British the fact we're even it, having this conversation won't. about no deal is so reckless and irresponsible. I just can't well, believe no. it's still on the table. The government's own statistics have showed that the GVA in my area would be hit by 16%. Well, We've just lost... But if you believe British British deal was going to happen, deal. you would have voted for it. You would vote for this in, in a week's time. I don't so you believe, clearly don't. But I don't believe Re Theresa May is going to let it happen because no right. responsible Prime Minister So Anna do doesn't believe that no deal is going to happen and you don't believe that no Brexit is going to happen. I, One of you's got to be wrong somewhere. I, 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 what I hope a new Conservative leader will do, a new Prime Minister, will insist that we will leave on the 31st of, Mar um, of October, come what may, and use that as the leverage to deal with the backstop. Because bear in mind, the real, the, what motivates me about the backstop, were we in the backstop and we finish up having to treat Northern Ireland differently, changing the status of Northern Ireland without the consent of the people of Northern Ireland, and so that they stay in a customs that's union as we leave. Scotland would then demand yeah. the same you know, thing that, too, an and it would start to, to break the up the EU, United and Kingdom. And they've already shut the door on that, on that whole conversation. Well, then they're responsible for that. Well, I mean, let them be responsible for that. Uh, if okay. we have to leave without an agreement, let the EU take responsibility for that. And I don't know if you saw that brilliant BBC documentary with Giva Hofstedt. Um, going through the whole process, the one time that Barnier and Verhofstadt started to get worried is when they thought we might be leaving without well, an agreement. Except they, they began to get really worried. As we saw at the EU Council meeting Except too. They now, yeah. they've now got six months to plan and what are we doing? We're still arguing about the and same old deals probably well, until I'm, October. I, 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 won't I won't accept responsibility for that because well, the, Prime that Minister, the, Nobody does. the Prime Minister completely departed from the policy we were elected on um, in, in, at Chequers last summer and shattered the unity of the Conservative Party. We were riding high in the opinion polls okay. by that. And, and there was a, a relatively small group of hardline Remainers who were threatening the government at that stage. Uh, she's Jenkins. got a far bigger problem that she's created by departing from that uh, policy. Andrew Jenkins is not alone amongst Tories who find it quite hard to wholeheartedly encourage passionate Brexiteers like yourself to vote Conservative this week in the elections. Will you be? I'll be voting Conservative and I would encourage everybody who usually votes Conservative to vote Conservative because it's only the Conservative Party that will keep uh, Jeremy Corbyn out of office in the long run. And do you feel that you can support what your leadership are doing now? Because very few people understand still the position that they're taking on Brexit. And I've been very... We, we need more clarity, that's absolutely right, but I think we're in the right position now. The, the Theresa May is moving to us. Well, I think we've got to be much clearer. We've got to be much straighter and more direct to say we've got to go back to the people. I, I think Jeremy's got in the right place now and Keir has pushed that. We've been clear that we'll have a, a, a confirmatory ballot. That is Labour Party it's policy. It's a very as agreed, in your party too, As, as agreed at conference. But the, the important thing is we, we've got to get out there because if, if we don't, particularly in the North East, if, if we don't elect Labour MEPs, then we're going to see a shift to the far right. I do not want to be re represented by far right parties in Europe. That's absolutely devastating. So people have got to uh, vote for the party that's traditionally outward facing, global and um, that represents what our values. What about Brexiteer? Let's say um, Johnson, Boris Johnson was leader and he offered a second referendum then. Would that be palatable to you? Well I don't think he's going to be elected leader if he is elected leader on a mandate to have a second referendum. I honestly think a second referendum is the last thing the Even if it's offered want. by a Brexiteer in the hope of, well, of, of finalising the question once and for all? Well, we, we were told by the government and everybody that it was going to finalise the question last time. I mean, if you really want to undermine the whole credibility of our democratic system, go ahead and have a second referendum. I'm going to That's ask. a real problem <laughs> for the people who are... And it's, it's the standard procedure of the European Union. Make them have another yeah, referendum. The they got it. Got I'm the decision sorry, the wrong. The 2016 referendum has already undermined democracy substantially, and uh, those MPs who want to do the right thing as, delegate, as representatives of their community have been put in very difficult situations of so trying to do what's I, right I for their community. I understand that, and let me, let me sympathise, because I think... The House of Commons, the majority in the House of Commons, did not get the result that it wanted. It's not, and about I think what it we does want. create a got collision. Any result, that's the point. It, it does got any result. Yeah, but, years but, old. but we promised, the we all promised solemnly that we were going to implement the result. I think we're all under an obligation. And, and to you do could that argue now. that you have failed to do well, that. Now I haven't failed to do well, that. What if it's well, not you have voted for Brexit. Okay. I didn't vote. I voted against the extension. Let me ask. Let me ask finally. Who thinks that the PM will be bringing the vote 
next week? Well, I think it's uh, anything's uh, possible, but I think the fact that the Prime Minister's pressed ahead with this, given the breakdown in the talks with the Labour Party, the, the discussions with ourselves having gone nowhere, is really a big surprise to me. Uh, I don't understand she her shouldn't. strategy. I don't understand her strategy. And I think that everybody's now marking time, waiting for the new Prime Minister. Do, do and that's think, what's going on. Do you think on. this will happen, this I, second reading? I, I just can't understand the strategy either. Um, I hope it does happen, because if, if it doesn't, then what else? What next? What alternative is there? And we'll have wasted another six months since she lost a historic defeat in, in Parliament, having achieved absolutely nothing. So something has to give. She needs to look to where the votes are in Parliament and, and make some concessions. There's a lot of affection and respect for Theresa in the party, but a lot of anger at the mistakes that she's made. And um, I, today seems to have compounded the situation for her. Okay. I, I bet tomorrow's papers are going to be pretty rotten for her. We will get and that may well raise the temperature and the pressure for an early leadership election. Well, earlier than next week? Well, it won't happen earlier than next week, but I mean, I think it will accelerate the process. Thank you all very much.